I am Marta Garcia Ruiz, Regional Analyst at Intelligence Fusion, and I will be talking about the maritime security scenario in the Gulf of Mexico. So when we look at the Gulf of Mexico, it is quite peculiar when we look at the wider region. Um, when discussing the Americas and the Caribbean, the main activity is drug trafficking. And this involves cartels. Uh, we see um, ships being boarded and uh, we see um, ships being deterred from sailing the waters because of uh, the, criminal, the, criminal, the aforementioned criminal activity. So uh, when we look at the Gulf of Mexico, why is it different? Because it is more similar to the crime we observe in, in Singapore Strait. Uh, save in the port of Manzanillo, in the Gulf of Mexico, we, we observe petty theft, uh, attacking uh, offshore platforms and mainly stealing equipment, electronics, and more recently, uh, scuba diving gear, uh, breathing apparatus, and so on. So that's how they differ. Regarding instances, the trend is irregular. It ebbs and flows. So in 2020, there was an increase of attempted, attempted robberies and robberies against vessels and platforms. Actually, Joint War Committee released a bulletin warning about the increasing number of incidents in the region. And this could have been because there was a shortage of security personnel uh, because of the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. Then we witnessed a decrease in 2021 and again, an uptick in 2022, where actually uh, incidents have become more common and more violent. When analysing the maritime security scenario, we look at a risk assessment model, and this has a particular taxonomy, which involves uh, capability, intent and opportunity. So when talking about capabilities, uh, criminals usually use speedboats. They normally attack at night. And previously, we've seen up to five uh, criminals uh, during a theft-related uh, incident. Lately, it's been up to 10. And the incidents we have locked uh, show a higher degree of uh, violence. And, and that's because they are heavily armed. They, we've normally seen them with assault rifles and they normally perpetrate uh, more injuries, they cause more injuries to the hostages and that could be for different reasons. They could be funded, they could be supported by cartels and of course since crimes go severely underreported we can we, we can contend um, different visions but we can really say for sure. And one of the problems that comes along with it or one of the problems uh, why uh, incidents um, go on the reported and it's hard to, to prevent these crimes and to later on track down these vessels is because the Mexican Navy has been deemed inefficient. They don't, the, the response is not rapid and they're unable, either unable or unwilling to track down the vessels. And this is interesting because uh, according to my own research, the Mexican Navy is the third best equipped in Latin America in terms of naval ships but it is also true that due to the pandemic a lot of naval forces have been deployed to relieve um, to aid uh, pandemic relief efforts so maybe they're they're looking more indoors instead of outdoors outdoors it is important to stress that the intent is financial it's profit uh, there is no geopolitical narrative as we might uh, have observed in the gulf of guinea with the niger delta region or youth groups or abu sayyah group uh, the islamic uh, uh, group abu sayyah group when they perpetrated uh, kidnappings up until 2020 it is mainly financial now maritime intelligence companies seem to wrestle with this issue there are different theories uh, some companies and some reports uh, highlight the fact that there is little evidence to link cartels with uh, offshore attacks, so that there's actually no association between onshore criminal activity and offshore criminal activity in the Gulf of Mexico. And what they like to contend is that it is actually uh, disenfranchised fishermen 
that due to their uh, socioeconomic grievances, they have been pushed towards uh, maritime crime. Uh, they could also be uh, former, as I mentioned before, former um, oil rig uh, workers that uh, feel resentment uh, towards the company because uh, we have actually recorded a protest in Dos Bocas, in the port of Dos Bocas, where uh, protesters have complained about uh, the poor uh, social conditions and the lack of settlement um, um, after dismissal. And they have also complained about uh, late salary payment. So that is the main that is their main focus. They say it's fishermen and employed like um, workers. Uh, we, I mean, something else that's fostered socioeconomic grievances in in fishermen is uh, the banning of uh, Mexican vessels to enter U.S. ports. This was a decision that the American government. Um, took because Mexico is uh, a non-compliant country when it comes to battling IUU fishing, illegal, un unre unregulated and unreported fishing. Uh, so that could have fostered uh, the need for fishermen to, to go towards the sea and, and commit maritime crime. Other companies differ, they diverge from this theory that I've just mentioned, and they believe that there is in fact cartel involvement. Even though there's little evidence, uh, there are local reports stating that cartels uh, might be hiring fishermen and former uh, platform workers to perpetrate uh, search attacks on their behalf. And some other local reports state that over 250,000 fishermen have been extorted by two main cartels, uh, Cartel de Sinaloa and Cartel Jalisco, Nueva Generación, to perpetrate the attacks. Furthermore, the fact that um, we've seen an uptick in violence, an increase in violence during recent attacks, that could also mean, or that could also translate into more funding or support by these criminal, these criminal organizations since the, sophistica the sophistication of the actual attacks uh, has increased or has been leveled up. Opportunity. Is there a lot of opportunity for perpetrators, for criminals, to carry out these attacks? So I would say yes, and I would say yes for three main reasons. The first reason would be that there are a lot of infrastructure. There's a lot of infrastructure, there are a lot of, there are a lot of oil projects undergoing and planned for the near future. We've seen companies invested uh, in the region. These companies go from Pemex, to uh, Luke Oil, to also Chinese investors. So this means that there are a lot of oil platforms that are, are developing their assets or that will be developing their assets soon. Uh, hence, there are a lot of uh, targets for potential attacks. The second one is commercial traffic. So uh, commercial traffic has increased, or at least it has uh, maintained its stability um, since the pandemic. This is because heavy works have been done on the Panama Canal and vessels from Panama into the Gulf of Mexico are regular. So in the case that petrol piracy was to become an issue again, as it was in the past, uh, cartels could siphon uh, oil from vessels again, or they could target vessels again for boarding purposes or simply for theft of electronics, as it might be. The third reason why there is opportunity for criminals to continue their shenanigans is um, private armed guards. So private armed guards are used to, are hired to bolster security in the high seas. Why is this problematic? Because the offshore platforms, they fall under the jurisdiction of the Mexican government meaning that the attacks are labelled as maritime uh, crime and not as piracy, because piracy is an issue of the high seas, whereas maritime crime falls under uh, internal and territorial waters. So I would say that those are the three main reasons why I see potential attacks um, coming and going in an irregular way, because that's their nature, it's regular, it ebbs and flows, but they will keep on going.
Something else that I predict is uh, maritime criminals resuming their activities after a hurricane season. Because we've seen this before. The Gulf of Mexico does suffer from all that uh, witness tropical storms and hurricanes often, not only in the spirit of time with the hurricanes we've witnessed in the area. And yes, it will remain. In, I think it will remain regular. I think even if there's cartel activity, it will not look like the West uh, of uh, Latin America, um, threatening container ships uh, mainly. I think it will remain petty theft with uh, higher or lower degrees of violence. So what does the future hold for the region? When we look at the Gulf of Mexico, efforts have been made. Only in Campeche, 35 vessels have been inspected. Uh, land, both land and sea routes have been inspected as well. And illegal fisheries and equipment such as scuba diving gear and breathing apparatus have been seized. However, I do not think this is enough. This is very much an ad hoc operation and the region would require of a more, a longer term vision to prosper. Uh, and of course, to be able to battle uh, this, this great issue. And something else that the region would need to, to fight uh, maritime crime would be to, um, to increase the funding to fight particular issues such as illegal fishing and wildlife trafficking. Because at the end of the day, it's a vicious cycle. We, it's not only about preventing attacks, uh, but to uh, get to the root of the cause, so tackle the, the root of the cause, and to help those that are in need, as it is the case of the fishermen and, and sacked uh, employ, um, platform workers that have been, um, have been victimized in a way by we could say, the lack of biodiversity, by the lack of economic resources and so on. So that, that could be one way to go. Currently, only 58 ports are supervised by five inspectors. So I would say that investment or funding in both uh, security-related issues, but also more human security would be needed, as I, uh, I mentioned before. Thanks for watching the episode of The Insight. If you want to know more, please uh, head over to our Discord by using the link in the description below.